What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to my top 10 quarterback prospects for the 2021 NFL Draft. Quick reminder, please do hit that like button down below as well. If you enjoy this video, if you enjoy my draft content, I do encourage you to check out my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash that franchise guy where you can not just support this channel and all of this draft content, but get even more of it by gaining access to the TFG Draft Insider Package. You can get full quarterback profile breakdowns on all of these players, film breakdowns on the majority of these quarterbacks, as well as access to my comprehensive draft board that's going to have upwards of 500 players on it with evaluations, draft grades, scheme fits, you name it. So if you enjoy this video, if you enjoy my draft content, you want to support the channel in the process and get exclusive content on top of all that, it's a great package if you ask me. A little biased, but I'll stand by it. Patreon.com slash that franchise guy. Thank you in advance for checking it out. All right, let's get into the good stuff here. Uh, a quick reminder as well that uh, in these breakdowns, you will see my individual quarterback traits that I look for and grade when I evaluate quarterbacks. They are detailed in brief text in the description below if you want to know what those are about. Uh, but I also spent six, seven minutes talking about them in one of my most recent podcasts, uh, breaking down the quarterbacks in the NFL, uh, which I will also link in the description below right next to the text for those quarterback traits. Uh, so check all that down below. All right, starting at the bottom of my top 10 list, quarterback number 10, Shane Buchel. Nothing overly exciting here, but I like his game. And it feels like Buchel has been a part of college football since, uh, let's just say, about the time that they were making a college football video game. It's not quite that long, but it does seem that way. He started his career at Texas, where he played as a freshman, ended up transferring to SMU after losing out that job. Uh, but I really like the development he showed throughout his career. It's nothing crazy here. You're talking about a day three pick for a backup caliber player. But my comp for him is Chase Daniel, where he's not a great athlete. He doesn't have a strong arm. He's probably never going to be a starter in the NFL. But a smart player, good pocket presence, a cheap four-year backup on a rookie contract for, say, a sixth-round pick where he can sit behind a Patrick Mahomes or, I don't know, one of these good quarterbacks, a Deshaun Watson, whoever it may be, where you're not expecting him to start, but you do need a backup that can play in the event of emergency. And I think Shane Bruchel can totally do that. And he's got better accuracy than you'd expect for a guy that doesn't have a very strong arm. Of course, that accuracy drops off on those NFL throws for a guy that just can't really command the ball all that well. But I do like his game. I like his yearly growth. He's a very smart passer. So Shane Buchel cracks the top 10. Then my number nine quarterback is kind of the polar opposite, and that's Davis Mills. He is more of a, a blank slate type of moldable prospect to me. Yes, he's a senior, but, you know, really didn't get that full-time passing opportunity at Stanford. He was a two-year starter, but last year, the COVID season, the Pac-12 didn't play as many games, and just the, the scheme that Stanford ran the, themselves left his tape very indistinguishable. I kind of left watching Davis Mills wondering, okay, what if he played in a West Coast offense? What if he played in a Shanahan offense where he was being utilized more as a passer? Because they ran a very old school power run game, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. Okay, we're going to run play action on third down. Like just not a lot to take away from Davis Mills tape. Now, there's not good tape on Davis Mills, but there's also not that much bad tape on him either. He's a decent athlete. He's built really well. He's got a relatively strong arm. He's not particularly accurate, but there might be something there if you sit him, you know, make him that developmental quarterback. Maybe you stash him on the practice squad for a year, and maybe he turns into something. So very different quarterback from Shane Buchel, um, but there just might be something there in Davis Mills. Then my number eight quarterback is uh, an interesting one, and I'm just going to say the circumstances surrounding Jamie Newman are unfortunate. Uh, he ended up opting out of his final season. He, he transferred from Wake Forest to Georgia after he had second to third round hype and was really excited to see him play at Georgia, as were many people. Now, I totally respect his decision to opt out, um, but I'm going to be completely straightforward here. It set him behind the eight ball. You look at other seniors in this class, guys like Kyle Trask, Felipe Franks is coming up, uh, even you know Zach Wilson, Mac Jones. Those guys probably were behind Jamie Newman before the season started. And because we didn't get to see that growth from Jamie Newman, they just passed him up. How could they not? You saw it 
in real life. You saw that progression happen. Whereas with Jamie Newman, there's just some more of that fog of war. Uh, so it, it's just a difficult situation. You needed to see from him going to Georgia, improved footwork, better downfield accuracy. You wanted to see some of that growth with his processing. He's an interesting prospect. I love his quick release. I compare him to Dwayne Haskins for that reason. If you put him in a West Coast system, a dream fit for me is like Arizona in like the fifth round because I think he could step in uh, or even the fourth round. But I don't know if you spend a, that high of a pick if you're Arizona, but they could use a backup. Uh, but he's got that rapid fire release just like Dwayne Haskins had coming out. And he's accurate in the short game and Arizona eats off of the short passing game like that. Uh, in that horizontal offense. There's other systems like that as well. Um, but a team that can utilize that quick release uh, and kind of put the ball in playmakers' hands because of that, he he could have a chance to uh, stick early on, and then maybe he does develop some of those other aspects of his game. He's got a strong arm. He's a good athlete. The downfield accuracy was definitely a concern to me, but part of that was his footwork. So definitely some fog of war there with Jamie Newman. I think the COVID circumstance did certainly impede on his ability to be a second or a third round pick to get a longer opportunity to develop at the next level. So I would just say he's behind the eight ball for unfortunate circumstances. I'll be rooting for him at the next level. Uh, just certainly a lot of fog of war there with Jamie Newman. Then my next quarterback here, I did not anticipate being as high on as I was. And it, it kind of started at the senior bowl. And this is Felipe Franks out of Arkansas, former quarterback for the Florida Gators. And it started with the Senior Bowl where he was really dropping dimes. You see this tall, strong, six foot five, six foot six quarterback, you know, nailing dudes in, in tight windows uh, down the field, dropping some of the best throws of the week. And he definitely piqued your interest. And I got to his tape, and I'm not going to lie, man, I liked it a lot more than I expected for someone that I expected to be a very raw pocket passer with not a lot of swagger and, and inspiration there. And that wasn't his tape. He he had a bit of an it factor about him. You listen to him talk in the in the pressers, like he has a very strong conviction and leadership, just kind of the interactions that he had with his teammates on the sideline. There was something about him that just kind of piqued my interest. And the way he plays on the field, he's very tough. He took a lot of hits, fought for tough yardage, uh, and, and made some plays, man, down the stretch. So there was something about him that really clicked for me. I love the downfield accuracy. Now, he's not a great athlete. He is going to need pass protection if he's going to have any bit of success at the next level. But with that accuracy, with the character, his processor is fine. He could definitely needs to speed up that processor if he's ever going to be a starter. Um, but I just think there's something there with Felipe Franks. I love quarterbacks that overcome adversity, and he totally did. He ends up losing that job to Kyle Trask after getting injured, transfers somewhere else, and totally made the most of it, passing someone up like Jamie Newman. So uh, I like the character there for, from, from Felipe Franks, the, the football character and the toughness, and he's got the traits as well. Uh, so uh, Felipe Franks going to surprisingly come in in my top 10 list. I did not see that coming, I'm going to be honest, but I was impressed. Uh, and then I have Kyle Trask at QB6, and I kind of jokingly in like, September when he really popped on the scene early I had caught about a half of him playing and there's all this hype right there's announcers comparing him to Josh freaking Allen which was just stupid from the get-go um you got people wondering is he going to be a first round pick is he going to be competing with Trevor Lawrence for the number one pick like all this crazy hype about Kyle Trask and I was like uh yeah I watched a half he looks like Nick Foles like he's not athletic he's got a noodle arm and he puts the ball in harm's way and little did I know that as I sat through all of Kyle Trask's tape, my God, have I never had a better quarterback comparison than Nick Foles for Kyle Trask. And that's an insult and a compliment. I have him as a third to a fourth round pick. And as a player that I think he's a career backup, but he's a streaky player. Like I said, he doesn't have the athletic traits. Uh, what he does have is, is an aggressive processor. He can read a defense, but sometimes he gets fooled and he doesn't really adjust after getting fooled. And what that leads to is really streaky play. Sometimes he's going to be right for two, three quarters, even a whole game. And he's going to look good. He's going to look like Peyton Manning, Tom Brady out there, just boom, 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 dissecting defenses. But the second he's wrong, which is inevitably going to happen, I think. I don't, I don't see at his age that all of a sudden him becoming, you know, some elite processor. Then he turns into Nick Foles, where he's chucking it up into double coverage and you're tearing your hair out and you're saying, why'd you make that throw? 
that's a decent player for a backup quarterback because he's going to give you a weekly kind of upside if you have to go to him. Think Nick Foles, think Jameis Winston. Like he's a poor man's Jameis Winston for sure, but because Winston's more athletic and a stronger arm. Um, so, you know, Trasky's relatively accurate. He's got a decent processor, but he's aggressive and he lacks physical traits. So I, I don't know exactly what you do with that uh, long term. If you need, I guess, a backup in the third round that can maybe win you a game here or there, you take him. But uh, there's just not a lot of desirability there with Kyle Trask for me. And then we have Mac Jones and like Felipe Franks, but to a much larger level, I ended up liking Mac Jones a lot more than I expected. Like, holy crap, I, I did not think I was going to like Mac Jones, especially based on kind of all the, the rough things I said about Tua last year, where he's playing for this amazing team. His job is super easy. On tape, I didn't think Tua showed like all these amazing traits that people were hyping him up as this lock top five pick. I, I had some hesitations on that. Uh, now, Mac Jones and Tua are very different players. I, I need to get that straight, though I think they have the traits that can make them say a top 20 quarterback, but they're going to have a hard time ever consistently being say a top 10 quarterback because of a lack of arm talent and really all those, you know, high end traits that get you to that next level. Now, Mac Jones is much different than Tua. I would say his processor is incredible. I think Mac Jones has the best processor in this class. And that is what surprised me the most out of Mac Jones when I went in to watch him because based on what I saw from Tua last year, traditionally with these teams and these quarterbacks that play on these dominant programs, it's first read throw after first read throw after first read throw, and it's just easy throws to these wide open receivers. And yes, there was plenty of those with Mac Jones. But what popped to me with Mac Jones was when that first read wasn't there, it was boom, 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 getting through his progressions, even getting onto like his fourth read against pressure in, in like the national championship game. Like there was some moments in there I was like, all right, this is not just the Alabama thing. Like he is processing defenses at a very high level. And on top of that, he moves incredibly well in the pocket. That was also very surprising to me. Uh, and that's why he gets the Jimmy Garoppolo comp here. And you'll see in my, my quarterback traits, there's a difference to me between pocket sense and play extension. He's not a great play extender. He doesn't have the athletic traits to do that. But in a Tom Brady sense of the word, he will navigate the pocket and extend plays within the pocket at an extremely high level that I didn't see from Tua and I didn't expect to see from Mac Jones. So there are traits there that are very redeemable for Mac Jones that will give him a chance to succeed as a pocket passing player. Now he's going to get a lot of Kirk Cousins comps at the next level. I don't see it. He's got better pocket presence than Kirk Cousins and his arm talent is not nearly as good as Kirk Cousins. Cousins, I think is gonna be a much more accurate vertical thrower. Um, so I, I, go, I go with the Jimmy Garoppolo comp. I think their games are very similar for that reason. I think New England at 15 makes a ton of sense. I do think if you're uh, Chicago or Washington, you can win next year uh, and beyond with Mac Jones, but I do think you gotta trade up to get him. So I like Mac Jones a lot more than I expected, especially given the hard, uh, narratives I've pushed towards Alabama quarterbacks, towards Ohio State quarterbacks, and like these amazing surrounding, co surrounding cores, there's still things you can do within your own game that will help you stand out. Uh, so uh, Mac Jones and Tua actually coming in with ironically fairly similar grades for me, uh, although this year I feel like I'm maybe a little higher on Mac Jones, and last year's a little lower on Tua, uh, but they're very different players. Those, those guys should not be connected for any reason once they get into the NFL. Uh, just worth noting because they're both coming out of Alabama in back-to-back -back years. Anyway, my number four quarterback here is Trey Lance, and he is the ultimate blank slate, high upside prospect, call it boom or bust. I take the opinion that he is the most polarizing quarter pro quarterback prospect to ever come out of college. Here's why. Go back to his high school career, was this uber athlete, but played at a small school in Minnesota. The only division one offer he got was to play at the University of Minnesota as a receiver tight end. North Dakota State was like, we see the arm talent, we're gonna plug you into our system, and we're gonna make it work. And then he throws 28 touchdowns to zero interceptions, though you watch that tape and it's it's fine. Uh, it's not like he's dissecting defenses and making all these crazy throws that he shouldn't be able to make. 
it's all pretty much in structure, pretty easy throws, a lot of stuff getting schemed up. And when those first reads weren't there, he pretty much just kind of took off and run, which at that level of competition is perfectly fine because he's just a better athlete than anyone on the field. And they were usually up by two scores by the end of the first quarter anyway, so it didn't really matter at the end of the day. Um, but he only, you know, there's more games in his career where he threw for less than 10 passes than there are games in his career where he threw more than 20. So, you know, he just wasn't asked to do a lot at North Dakota State, but when he, the things that he was asked to do, he executed. So there's really not a lot of great tape for Trey Lance, but there's really not a lot of bad tape either. So as a player coming out of high school, he's polarizing. His tape in his freshman year is polarizing. Then you throw in the COVID situation where he basically didn't get a season. His tape for that one game, it's very difficult to take anything away from that because there's that's just we've never seen a situation where a team, what do they practice? Like two weeks for one game season and then they just hang it up? Like who knows what the what the motivations for both sides were in that game. It's just hard to evaluate. I will say it looked like he sped up his release in that game, which was good to see. Um, but yeah, just everything surrounding Trey Lance from his backstory to his play on the field to his high-end athleticism to the COVID season, it's like this atomic bomb of polarization. Talk about fog of war. Uh, he is a blank slate prospect, the ultimate boomer bust player. But for a lot of those reasons we said, you know, he needs time to sit and develop. He's a raw passer. And if he goes to a team that's asking him to start right away, I don't know how well that's going to work out. If he gets time to sit and develop for a year, I like him a lot. Uh, so I believe in the kid. I'm totally kind of one foot in, one foot out. I would love to see him come out and be this next Patrick Mahomes story. Um, but if I'm drafting the guy, I definitely have a little bit of hesitation. I need to have a plan for him as well. Then that takes me to my number three quarterback, that is Justin Fields. And I like Justin Fields. My comparison for him is Ryan Tannehill, which sounds weird, but the traits that he has are very similar to Ryan Tannehill. He's incredibly accurate downfield. He's got a strong arm. He is very athletic when it comes to designed runs, but as far as functional athleticism as a passer, I do think he struggles at times to sense pressure and use some of that quick twitch athleticism to extend plays. So the more I watch Justin Fields, the more and more Ryan Tannehill I see. And that's why I love Justin Fields to like Atlanta, where he's going to run that same system where they're really, you know, creating opportunities where that first read is not only schemed up very well to get open, but is schemed up to create big plays. Think about like A.J. Brown on those crossing routes, turning into Julio Jones in Atlanta, that kind of thing. Um, now, there is a problem with Justin Fields' tape that I think is glaring. It punches you in the face when you play, and I wish I could show the tape here in this video, but because of copyright, I just can't. You can either head over to my Patreon and check out my film breakdown on him to see what I'm talking about, or just dial up his Northwestern tape, There's, or actually, frankly, his Indiana tape, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. The highs are there. I love the highs with, with Justin Fields. That's why I have him uh, in my What I Would Do mock drafts going forward to Atlanta. But he has a frustrating problem when it comes to staring down first reads. And some people have said that's because of what he's asked to do at Ohio State. Well, then you get into the whole like, all right, but none of the quarterbacks coming out of Ohio State have really weeded that out at the next level. So I will say that, um, but I, I think it's something he can work on, and that is his ability to stare down first reads, which is not really an ability. It is a, a problem. It is a red flag to the degree where, like, he'll snap the ball and stop moving his feet and just stare down an out route that's clearly covered up. In the NFL, you need to see that that's covered up and get through your progressions. He doesn't do it. He very rarely does it. Like 80, 90% of the time, he's dialed in on that first read, and it's a serious issue. The play against uh, Indiana where he's staring down an out route against a zero blitz, and he doesn't even see the blitz because he's so tunnel vision on that outside receiver. And last second, he feels the blitz, he uses his remarkable athleticism just to throw the ball away. That's not the only play. It happens week after week after week. Even in his best games, it shows up. Uh, so he needs to develop that processor if he's going to play in the majority of systems in the NFL where he is asked to go through his progressions uh, and, and be that sharp quarterback from a, a mental edge part of the part of the game. Now, if he goes to Atlanta and, you know, like I said, he can be Ryan Tannehill, but if he he's going to be a top 10 quarterback with this, you know, 
Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, sharp, like week to week dominance, where even if you take away that first read, they can get through their progressions, they can improvise. He's got a long way to go if he's gonna show that kind of upside. And that's the biggest reason why I have Zach Wilson as my number two quarterback. Now, there's people that have Justin Fields ahead of Zach Wilson. And if you believe he's got a higher upside and you wanna take a leap of faith with Justin Fields, I can, I can get behind that. Like you're going off a gut feel, like you just, you believe that, you know, Zach Wilson played at this lower level of competition, which is a bullshit argument, by the way, because Zach Wilson's job at BYU is, um, you know, significantly more difficult than Justin Fields at Ohio State as far as pass protection and receivers screaming open uh, and scheme asking much, much less of Fields than it does of Wilson. So that's just a bullshit narrative anyway. But if you believe that, I, I get it. Um, but when it comes to their film, the reality is Zach Wilson just has this extreme understanding of the passing game that I frankly, I, Mac Jones kind of has it, but I don't think Trevor Lawrence has it. I don't think Fields, Lance, Trask, any of these guys have the understanding of the passing game that Zach Wilson has. It is extremely impressive. And the development that he's shown to get to the, to the point that he's at right now shows me that he's got this like you know that film room junkie mentality about him that most of the best quarterbacks in the nfl not most of all of the best quarterbacks in the nfl the top eight top ten quarterbacks they are they are tuned into understanding what defenses are doing and what he can do as a passer to manipulate those things the second the ball is snapped where's the safety what's the coverage is my first read open or not okay it's not i'm going to get through these progressions it's cover three i'm going to hold this safety which is going to create a one-on-one -on -one for my receiver on the outside. Cover two, okay, I can kind of hold this safety and you know split the sideline uh, the second that that squat defender lets him go. He just has the ability to throw with leverage away from defenders. And then you add on top of that, that he does all of this with this beautiful pocket presence. You know, Joe Burrow-esque, Aaron Rodgers-esque, Patrick Mahomes-esque pocket presence to sense pressure, navigate the pocket while keeping his eyes downfield. <laughs> It, it really, it's not even close to me between Wilson and Fields as far as how natural Fields as a passer, uh, sorry, how natural Wilson is as a passer compared to Justin Fields. And then, you know, if you say Fields is a better athlete, he's got higher physical upside, I say yes and no. I think arm talent wise, it's extremely comparable. I would call that a push. Accuracy, I do give the nod to Fields, but it's not like Wilson has bad accuracy. But I do think you know Fields' vertical accuracy is is a huge threat and gives him a chance to succeed. Uh, and then as far as their like athleticism, yes, Fields is a better runner. He's faster as far as long speed and he's more powerful as a runner. But I would actually argue that Zach Wilson has better functional athleticism as a passer as far as quick twitch athleticism that he can use to kind of manipulate that pressure and extend plays. And it's not like Wilson is slow. So if they're comparable athletically, which I think is extremely fair to say, Wilson's just understanding of the passing game is is unparalleled in these with these top four quarterbacks. You know, Mac Jones is the only one that's close, in my opinion, but Jones just doesn't have the arm talent or the athleticism that Zach Wilson has. So I'm super impressed with Zach Wilson. I think whoever picks him at number two is is getting a very underrated player at this point in time that I think is under the radar closer to Trevor Lawrence than Fields is to Zach Wilson. So there's my case for Wilson over Fields. You can take it or leave it. Like if you want to be in on Fields and uh, believe in him, that's perfectly fine. Um, but I'm just explaining what I've seen on film and gave you games that you can go and watch. I think Wilson, basically any game you want to watch, will show you some of the things I detailed if you watch closely enough. Uh, so there you go. That's my that's my breakdown. Or you can you know, see what I'm saying on Patreon. Uh, so take it or leave it. That's the big debate is QB2 and 3 between Wilson and Fields. Uh, and then no debate here with QB1, who is Trevor Lawrence. Uh, we do get to actually spend some time talking about Lawrence here, which is fantastic because in my mock drafts, I just kind of gloss over him because that's chalk, right? Uh, he is, to me, the best quarterback in this class and definitely stacks up or is above the quarterbacks going back to like Andrew Luck. Uh, I wish that uh, I had my 
my grades from the time. A lot of you know I, I changed my grading system this year to match that eight point scale that the NFL uses. So I, I can't exactly give you his grade compared to the guys of the last three years, but I know he'd be at the top, quite possibly number one. Uh, so I love me some Trevor Lawrence. Now, the strengths and the reason we all love him, and I do give potential grades still, even though it's not in this graphic, his potential is 99. He could be as good as Patrick Mahomes. Uh, so that, that's, all, that's all obvious. Uh, the arm talent is incredible. He'll have top five to seven arm talent in the league the second he gets drafted. His accuracy is uh, quite possibly the best you'll ever see for a, a prospect coming out. His ability to command the football is just natural and will will give him a, a high level chance to succeed i would say for a 21 year old his processor is pretty damn good as he doesn't make a lot of mistakes out of structure and he's got that athleticism you know he doesn't have the quick twitch athleticism that some of these other guys have because uh, he is six foot six he's got some he's a long strider he's not going to be very sudden in his movements but if you're running man coverage and you give him a, a, a lane in your pass rush and you don't have a qb spy a lot of the, like his long runs actually are like Colin Kaepernick-esque. Like he's got those long arms and when he gets going, he is deceptively fast. Uh, so he, he will crush you if you run man coverage. Not only can he hit those tight window throws because his arm is incredible, um, but he'll run on you too. Uh, but I will say his pocket sense, his ability to kind of elude sacks, it's, it's not like Mahomes, Rogers, Mahomes, um, Russell Wilson esque, but it's fine. Like he'll do some of that stuff. I'd compare it to more like Stafford in that way, or, or Herbert who did some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, the upside is obvious. It punches us all in the face. Um, but he's got some of those issues as far as uh, not issues. I, I take that back. I think he, he's got a very high floor. I think worst case scenario, getting Stafford, Herbert, who's just big, strong, accurate quarterback with a decent processor. But if he's going to become Mahomes, Rodgers, Andrew Luck is my comp for him, that top five quarterback, he does need to continue to develop that processor and uh, you know maybe it develop some of that pocket sense a little bit. Those would be the only knocks on him. But again, he is a remarkable quarterback prospect. Jacksonville is going to get themselves a good one. Hopefully they don't screw him up. <laughs> I don't think they will. Uh, so there is my top 10 quarterbacks breakdown. I'm excited to hear what you guys think in the comments down below. Where do you agree? Where do you disagree? If you want to see even more details about these guys and uh, profiles on every player in this class, head over to my Patreons, patreon.com, uh, where you can get film rooms as well. Uh, see some of those reasons why I have Wilson over Fields, for example. Uh, so I, I hope you guys enjoyed and we'll see you guys on Saturday for my 2020 studs and duds finale that you guys have been waiting on. Uh, so I'm excited for that. Cheers as always, and we'll see you for the next one. Peace out.